Good morning, Sun Valley Church Saints. And you're going, wait a minute, I just was called a saint. <laughs> how would you, how would you uh, answer that question? Are you a saint? Yeah? Some of you aren't sure. And some of you aren't sure why the person beside you said yes, right? It seems that the further you get away from the biblical gospel, the less you understand the term saint, the concept of saint. The idea of saint or sainthood is, is central to the gospel message. Understanding the idea of saint is critical. So this morning we're going to be looking at this idea of sainthood um, for your encouragement, for your joy. And we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 4, verses 20 through 23. So if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to turn there with me. Philippians chapter 4, verses 20 through 23. And I'm going to start by defining the word saint. Uh, so how would you define that word, saint? Would, you, would your answer be that you know, saints are people who are really good, really, really good? They're always doing right. They're always doing the perfect thing. They're always putting others first. They're just, they nauseate people around them. You know, they're a saint. Uh, or maybe your definition would be closer to some of the Catholic church ideas of sainthood. Uh, saints are those whose pictures are etched into the stained glass windows of big churches um, because of their virtue, their merit, their devotion, their religious achievement or whatever. Um, but maybe you would you would think that way in order to achieve sainthood, you have to perform some kind of miracle or walk on water or something dramatic like that. And then maybe if the Pope is interested, he can put this title on you of sainthood. But the New Testament, particularly the Apostle Paul, describes saints differently than that. Uh, Paul writes that a saint is anyone who really comes to the saving knowledge, saving faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Saint, and Paul, this is the favorite term that Paul uses uh, for the Christian in the New Testament. He calls Christians saints over 40 times in the New Testament. A saint isn't a superhero, but simply the one who has put their faith, put their trust in Jesus Christ. If you have repented of your sins, if you've turned to Christ for mercy and grace, then you're a saint, according to the New Testament, which is why some of you answered correctly and said, yes, when I said, are you a saint? So if you're a saint, you've been separated from sin and united to Christ. That's all the biblical definition is. Paul concludes his letter here in Philippians by calling the Philippian Christians saints. Look at these verses with me, verses 20 through 23 of chapter 4 of Philippians. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Obviously, Paul is calling these Christians saints. And it wasn't because they were so pious that he called them saints. It wasn't because they had performed any miracle. Paul calls all Christians saints. And so if you're in that category, if you are in Christ, you're a saint, according to the Apostle Paul. Paul mentions four groups of saints in these verses that I want to point out to you as we begin our, our investigation of this passage. Look at, your, past, look at your, your text in front of you. There's four groups. The saints in Philippi, verse 21, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. He's talking to those who are receiving this letter. That is Christians in Philippi. Secondly, Paul recalls Christian leaders who are in Paul's company, saints. The brothers who are with me, like in prison. There's Christian brothers here and they're saints, they're greeting you. And then the third group, a larger company of believers in Rome, it says all the saints greet you. Do you see that there? Verse 22, all the saints greet you. All the saints here in Rome greet you who are in Philippi. And then fourth, this interesting group of Christians who, who were employed by or involved in the imperial court, Caesar's household. All the saints of Caesar's household greet you also. So Paul wrote, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. That's a key term here in understanding what it means to be a saint, uh, someone that Paul's referring to. If you're not in Jesus, you're not a saint. Being in Jesus is a requirement 
of being a saint. Remember, we're not talking about really good people. We're not talking about neat and pious people. We're not talking about those who say, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't chew, I don't go with girls who do. We're not talking about those people. We're talking about what Paul talked about here. Those sinners saved by God's grace and united to Jesus Christ. That's it. This relationship with, with Jesus Christ is unique to Christianity. Uh, Christianity is the only world religion that claims its followers are actually united to their religion's founder. No other religion claims that except Christianity. We say we are united to Christ, Jesus. We not only believe in Jesus, we believe we're united to him. And we believe that because that's what the Bible teaches. Remember Romans 6, 3 through 11? It tells us that we're united to Jesus' death for sin, which means that his death is our death. His victory over sin is our victory over sin. And now these things are important. The reason that your sins are forgiven, because what the wages of sin is what? Death. And the reason you don't have to die for your sin is because Christ took care of that on Calvary. And here's the cool part. If you're in Christ, you were with him on Calvary. You died for your sins on Calvary in Christ. Your sins are taken care of because you're in Christ. It's the same way that you're also destined for eternity with him because you're in Christ. His resurrection is your resurrection. His eternal life is your eternal life. This is an important truth. In Christ is one of Paul's favorite phrases. He uses this term, in Christ, 85 times in his letters. That's important to him. So that is the definition there. I hope you understand a little better what it means to be a saint. Now let's look at the life of saints. The life of saints. As we've just seen, the life of saints really begins at conversion. But how does that affect our daily lives. Okay, so you become a Christian, you know, in your parents' living room when you're, you know, eight years old. How does that affect your daily life? What does our union with Jesus Christ produce in us on a daily basis? Or maybe I should say, what should it produce in us on a daily basis? Let's begin with baptism, all right? This baptism idea usually follows for someone who comes to Christ. It's, it's that drama that God gave the church to demonstrate our union with Christ. Every time we baptize someone here at Sun Valley Church, we see a drama working out the picture of our union with Christ. A new believer steps into the waters of baptism and they demonstrate their faith in Christ Jesus. They demonstrate their union with Christ. So in the same way that Jesus was baptized, we baptize anyone who can give a reasonable profession of faith in Christ Jesus. So when you get into the waters of baptism, you exhibit your union with Christ by being submersed into the water, right? And what do you think that might relate to as, as you are dunked into the water? The death of Christ, right? Going into the grave, you go into the water. And then when you come out of the water, what do you think that represents? His resurrection. It demonstrates your union with Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. And then you get up and you walk out of the, the baptismal tank, and that demonstrates a, a desire, a commitment to following Christ daily as one who has been united to Christ's life, his resurrection life. So the whole drama of baptism demonstrates for the entire church, especially for the one who's in the tank, what it means to be unified or in union with Christ Jesus. Being called a saint is a great reminder to us that we have been set apart in Christ for Christ. Our, our lives ought to reflect that reality in our character, in our fellowship, and in our worship. These are the three areas I want to identify now for you that I get from these four verses that I read for you earlier. So our lives, our um, new life in Christ, our union with Christ live, ought to reflect the reality of, in our character, fellowship, and worship. Let's look at character first. How ought character be affected for the saints? If you're a saint, how ought your character be different than before you were a saint? Or maybe take your neighbor as an example who isn't a saint. The, the character of saints really is found in the definition of the word saint. 
the biblical definition of the word saint. It is literally translated as follows. Set apart, sanctified ones, and holy ones. That's how the word in the original language is translated in the Bible. Set apart, sanctified, holy ones. So I hope that these three ideas can show you these phrases, help you understand a little bit more what it means to be a saint in terms of our character. First, let's look at set apart. We are set apart for God's special use. That's one of the translations of the word saint. So this is how God described Old Testament temple implements. He said these temple implements are set apart for a special use. All right, they, they, were, they were only to be used for sacred purposes in the temple. You didn't use altar tongs to go outside the temple and pull weeds. They were used specifically for the altar and its sacrifices. This is the same way with a saint. Saints are set apart for a specific use in life. Once you become a saint, God has identified a path of life, a path of character to follow. And so you're set apart for that special use. Next, we see this idea of sanctified ones. It's also translated sanctified ones. So sanctification, as you know, is the process that we go through once we become a Christian. We were this way, we come to Christ, and he begins to change us to look like Jesus eventually. That's the idea of sanctification. And the word saint is translated that way in the Bible, sanctified ones. It's those who are slowly but surely becoming like Jesus. You should be able to identify this process in your own life if you're a saint. You should be able to look back over the past few years of your life and say, I can see change here, 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 and here. I, I think I'm becoming more like Christ. That, that ought to be the case with each and every saint. And then thirdly, of course, we have this idea of holy ones. That's another way that this word is translated. In fact, that's the closest literal translation to what the word is used here in Philippians 4. Holy ones, holy ones versus unholy ones versus worldly versus sinful. Our lives ought to reflect the, the life of the holy one, Jesus Christ. That's the word, how it's translated here in Philippians chapter 4, verses 21 and 22. He says, greet every holy one in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the holy ones greet you. That's what is literally translated here. So Jesus Christ has transferred us from darkness to light. That's a sanctifying process. That's a becoming holy process. The gospel of Jesus Christ has taken us from the family of Satan to the family of God. We're no longer rebels, no longer saints, no longer rebels, but saints. We are no longer competitors with one another, but we are saints. We are saints as fellow believers. We're saints, not Ain'ts, okay? You've heard that probably. Saints are described all over the New Testament, particularly in this wonderful little letter we've been studying for the past year, uh, um, what it means to be a saint. Saints are those who, because of our participation with the Holy Spirit, you remember back in chapter 2, Paul says, if you have any participation in the Holy Spirit... That's the entry into this idea of Christian character. Saints are those who, because of their participation in the same Holy Spirit, have the mind of Christ. Remember that? Verse 5 of, of Philippians chapter 2. Instead of preferring ourselves, this particular saintly mind prefers one and the others. Instead of looking out for our own interests, this saintly mind has others' interests and rights in view. We consider others to be more important than ourselves, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Now, this is why, of all people, we should be able to navigate this pandemic thing, all right? If, of all people in the world, the saints ought to be able to manage pandemic guidelines. There has, there has been, I think, way too much consternation about this in churches all around the world. But if we humbly count others as more significant than ourselves, what's that mean? We should be able to understand people in our church who view circumstances differently than we do. We should be able to mask up for those who are vulnerable or anxious about it. 
On the other hand, we should also be able to extend grace to those who are unable to mask up for some reason or another. This is how saints think. This is how saints act. Instead of thinking the worst in those who disagree with our perspective, we should think the best in them. We should, as Paul said to the Roman church, what? Accept one another. Jesus said that the greatest characteristic of saints is love. Didn't he? He said that in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. The greatest characteristic of the saint is love. Now listen to how Paul describes love in 1 Corinthians 13. Love does not insist on its own way. How does that help you or guide you as you deal with pandemic issues? Love does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never ends. And so the prevailing attitude of a saint is that of love. I think that's helpful for us as we navigate these difficult days. So let's look at the fellowship of the saints next. We have the character of the saints, now let's look at the fellowship. Paul made sure that the Philippians heard the greetings from all those around him. Did you notice that? All the saints greet you, especially those who see Sir the brothers greet you who are with me, they greet you. Paul used the word every there, do you see that? Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Why didn't he use the word all, like he has many other places, but he used the word every? Is there a reason for that? Well, you know the answer. Of course there's a reason. What is it? Why did Paul use the word every? It's because he wanted to make sure that each and every saint in Philippi felt his love and his affection. Each and every saint in Philippi felt the affection of all those in Rome who were sending greetings to the saints in Philippi. Each of the saints in Philippi were on equal footing. There wasn't some, you know, super Christians and then some not so super each of them were important to God. Each of them were important to Paul. Every one of them, each of them were part of God's grand plan for his kingdom. Each had a place. Each had a role. And Paul greeted them all. Every one of us who are saints have an important part to play in the kingdom of God, just as they did in Philippi in Paul's day. We are each gospel partners. That's what this letter has been about, securing and encouraging gospel, joyful gospel partners. And each of us has an important role to play as partners. Just as in business, every partner must play an important role in their business, we as gospel partners must play an important and specific role here as we continue as saints in this world. And I want you to notice that Paul treats everyone in the room that's there as he's writing this benediction, he treats them all the same. He, like I said, he doesn't highlight anybody. He doesn't drop names like we would. I mean, if you were in the presence of certain people, you would make sure it gets on Instagram quickly, right? This is how we operate, but not Paul here. He's saying something about our fellowship as saints. He, he doesn't name the superstars in the early church who were probably with him, Timothy. Everybody who knew Timothy was. Epaphroditus, everybody in Philippi knew who Epaphroditus was. Tychicus, who was the carrier of the letter of Philemon, Ephesians, and Colossians, was probably in the room with him. He didn't name him. Aristarchus was probably with him, a longtime companion of Paul, maybe Onesimus. You remember him? He's, he's the, the focus of the book of Philemon. Maybe even Luke and Mark were with Paul at the time of this signing. He didn't mention them. I would have. <laughs> I would have said, hey, and by the way, my buddy Luke is here. You know, I just, what, what do you, I mean, if you see some famous person, what do you do? Hey, you get a picture of them and put them on Facebook. This is me and Elvis, right? Right? Not Paul. He was commenting about what it means to be a saint. They're all prominent men in this room with him but he just calls them brothers, partners in the gospel, along with you Philippians. This is the fellowship of the saints. There's no elevation of one over the other. 
It's mutual humility, love, acceptance, affection, realizing each other's important role for the cause of Christ. This is the nature of fellowship. The word fellowship doesn't show up in the English Standard Version translation of Philippians, but the Greek word from which we get the word fellowship shows up five important times in this letter. Each time, it's translated participation or partakers. There's this idea that we've built our whole sermon series on. Joyful gospel partners. He starts back in chapter 1, verse 5. So turn there with me, if you would, back to chapter 1, verse 5 of Philippians. And I want to show you these five important ways that this Greek word was translated partnership or partakers. And by the way, the Greek word is a familiar word to all of us. It's koinonia, right? Translated fellowship or partnership. Here, Paul, we mean the English standard version translates the word partnership. And I think this shows the function of fellowship, all right? The function of fellowship. So Paul wanted us to think about partnership or fellowship in the following five ways. First in chapter 1, verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. It's the, the great task of getting the gospel out is part of what fellowship means, partners in the gospel. Secondly, look down at verse 7 of chapter 1. He says this, it's right for me to feel this way about you because all of you are, are partakers with me of grace. That's that word koinonia, fellowship partners of in with me in grace and so with this this grace of participation in other people's suffering for the sake of the gospel thirdly i want you to look over at chapter 2 verse 1 this is where he identifies saints with the holy spirit he says so if there is any encouragement in christ any comfort from his love any participation in the spirit that means you're a saint if the holy spirit has regenerated you you are a saint if you've come to faith you're a saint it's the idea of participating in the Holy Spirit through whom we have been baptized into one body. Fellowship. Fourth, look at verse 10 of chapter 3. Verse 10 of chapter 3. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and share in his sufferings. That word shares, participate, or fellowship in his sufferings. This is how we view our walk with Christ. It's part of walking with him through all the difficulties of the Christian life. And then finally, chapter 4, verse 15. We saw this here just a few weeks ago. And you, Philippians, yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in the giving and receiving except you only. Partnership, fellowship, koinonia. That's a really quick survey of how Paul viewed and used the word fellowship in this book. So when you and I talk about fellowship, what are we talking about? Are we talking about that time when we get together and barbecue hamburgers? We had really good fellowship last night. That's actually not, not fellowship, all right? I know we like to use that word because it sounds the word like Christians use. Um, not certain too many non-Christians use that word. But fellowship, according to Paul, according to the book of Philippians, is about our partnership in getting the gospel out. It's like the fellowship of the ring in Tolkien's book. It wasn't about having a barbecue. It was about going and destroying the ring, this group of guys. That's what they were all about. And that's our role. We are this fellowship of saints who are pursuing the glory of Jesus Christ in getting the gospel to the nations. That's our fellowship. All of these conversations about partnership in the gospel were intimately related to this very thing, getting the gospel message to the world. It, fellowship is partnership. It's not about the other things that you might be thinking about in terms of food. Paul meant his readers to understand that their fellowship was a partnership for the spread of the gospel. So when we gather to worship, to pray, to encourage, to motivate one another towards the greater and greater participation of the kingdom of God, that's what we're doing together. We're encouraging the fellowship of the saints to be focused on the spread of the gospel. Our Sunday services, for example, our small groups, our interpersonal relationships must be gospel-centered and mission-minded. 
Our friendships can certainly be around our mutual interests, fly fishing, whatever, but we must not forget the primary reason for which we were set apart, which we've been called holy ones, and that is the glory of Jesus Christ in the gospel. That is the primary purpose of our fellowship, of our relationship. So the life of saints includes our character, it includes our fellowship, and now here thirdly, it includes our worship. The worship of saints. It's very important that we as saints know whom we worship and that our worship is important. This isn't an extracurricular activity. Uh, this isn't an elective, if you want to think of it in academic terms. Our corporate worship is critical to who we are as saints. This is what we learn from verse 20. Paul had just got through describing all that he wanted to describe to the Philippian church about what it means to be a joyful gospel partner. How to, how to avoid losing your joy in your pursuit of Christ. How to avoid being ineffective as a gospel partner. This is what the book of Philippians has been about. And then as he concludes his thoughts in verse 20, he says, To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. He wraps it up by reminding the saints in Philippi of the importance of worship and how living a joyful gospel partner life is a form of worship. So he, he begins this benediction here in these four verses with this doxology. It's the conclusion to all he has said. This living the joyful gospel-centered life, gospel partner life, is what it means to worship. One of the primary activities of a saint is worship. I'm certain you're aware of that. You're here this morning, right? Worshiping God comes to a child of God naturally. When we come to Christ, this is kind of what we drift towards, a, a corporate worshiping of Christ, a personal worshiping of our Savior. And it comes natural to us. We see this in all of Paul's letters. Whenever Paul, you remember when he's writing his letters to these churches in the New Testament, whenever he completes some grand theological point, what does he do in the very next few verses? He writes a doxology, doesn't he? He's always describing how wonderful it is to have these truths before us as Christians, commenting on the eternality of God, the love of Christ, or some such thing like Romans 11, Ephesians 3. This is what Paul does. So we, we see some great glorious truth about our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and then immediately our heart responds in worship and praise. This is how we structure our worship services here. We want to reveal something about God to you, an aspect of God's love or, or grace or mercy, and then your natural response is to sing praises to God, to rejoice in the God of your salvation. This is the same thing we do when we're out in uh, the wilderness. You come across something beautiful, and what is your response? You don't go, hmm, and then walk away. What do you do? You go, wow, and you get a picture of it. That wow and picture is worship. And so when you come into church and you hear some element of who God is delivered to you, your natural response, your heart leaps to worship. This is what we're doing here together. This is what saints do. It is our natural, built-in response by the Holy Spirit to God himself. So in Philippians chapter 4, verse 20, Paul identifies God the Father as the recipient of our worship. To God and Father, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. He said that God is our Father. That's a personal pronoun. He's personally related to us. You remember in John 4, 23, Jesus taught that, that he came to earth to gather worshipers. He says this, Jesus did in John 4, the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. He's gathering saints, people who will respond to him in worship and praise. And the only way to worship God is to what? Know God. 
You can't worship something you don't know. There, there's no such thing as ignorant worship, in other words. Ignorant worship would mean that you're worshiping a god of your own imagination. You know what the Bible calls that, right? Idolatry. So if you're sitting there creating an idea of God that is inaccurate, that is not reflected in Scripture, you're creating an idol in your mind. This is idolatry. In his wonderful book, uh, The Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozer says this, Among the sins to which the human heart is prone, hardly any other is more hateful to God than idolatry. For idolatry is at the bottom of libel on his character. The idolatrous heart assumes that God is other than he is, in itself a monstrous sin, and substitutes for the true God one made after its own likeness. We're creating God in however we want to create him. And substitutes the true God for one made after his own likeness. Always this God will conform to the image of the one who created it, and will be base or pure, cruel or kind, according to the moral state of the mind from which it emerges. A God begotten in the shadows of a fallen heart will quite naturally be no true likeness to the true God. Thou thoughtest, quote from um, Psalms, thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as yourself. You thought I was like you? The psalmist asks. Surely this must be a serious affront to the Most High. God before whom cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, let us beware lest we in our pride accept the erroneous notion that idolatry consists only in kneeling before some visible objects of adoration and that civilized peoples are therefore free from it. The essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him, end quote. How important is it that we get the God thing right? It's really important. It's really important that we understand Scripture. When God is revealed to himself on the pages of Scripture, we must understand it if we're truly going to worship this God we say we do. We worship the one true God. He has revealed himself to human history on the pages of Scripture. He is our God and Father, and the saints worship him. Now, I have one more here that's not in your notes, but I'm gonna, I added it since I gave the notes to Deb for printing. So you can add, this is uh, letter D. The focus of the saints. The focus of the saints. So, so far we have covered the, um, let me remind you here of them. I think they're in your notes, but let me remind you anyways. It is the character of saints, the, um, can never, anyways, the worship of saints is the one we just covered, and now we're looking at the focus of the saints. What is the focus of the saints? I want you to look at verse 22, and I want to show you the focus, or the focus we ought to have as saints. All saints, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. That's the phrase I want you to focus on. Especially those of Caesar's household. Now, what an amazing statement that was for the Philippian church to hear. The salvation of Caesar's household. The people Paul was referring to were those that were actually related to Caesar and those who were in his employ. Household servants, soldiers, lawyers, anyone related to Caesar's household. Those who had come to Christ in Caesar's household, in the imperial household, who were saints. Most of them, by the way, were people who had become Christians while Paul was in prison in Rome from his teaching, from his evangelism. Now, what a joy this must have been for the Philippians. Can you imagine hearing those words from the Apostle Paul, the one you had supported financially and through prayer for years and years and years? And this is why you sent him out. This is why you have sacrificed. This is why you have done everything you've done to make sure he is supplied so that he could go out and preach the gospel. And he says this, the saints in Caesar's household greet you. (laughs) 
Let me give you an example of how that might make you feel. Imagine if Josh Ryan, Eli Moyer, Dwight Hires, were to send a message to Sun Valley Church one day saying, all the saints here greet you. Would that phase you? It ought to, it ought to make you leap for joy. When they went, there were no saints there. And now, because of your partnership in the gospel message in Othello, on the other side of the world, in Mexico, saints are being gathered. That's gospel partnership. That's why we've sent these missionaries out. That's why the Philippians sent out Paul, to hear these words. All the saints here greet you. The saints in Caesar's household greet you. There are many saints now in Othello because of your partnership in the ministry. What an amazing encouragement this must have been to them. We've played a part. God has used us for his glory in the saving of souls. Talk about giving meaning to your Christian life. Just being faithful here in Yakima, supporting our missionaries by being here, by giving, by praying, by participating however you can, is a wonderful thing. This is how the Philippians must have felt. They had played the role of gospel partners. Their sacrifices had borne fruit. And this was their focus from the beginning, the evangelism of the lost. This is pure affirmation, pure joy. So friends, our challenge here at Sun Valley Church is to keep the main thing the main thing. Not get derailed by superficial, petty things that the enemy would love for us to get derailed by, like our disagreement over pandemic guidelines. That's petty. It's stupid. Don't do it. Keep your eye on the main thing. Being a joyful gospel partner. And then finally, my third and final point here is seen in verse 23. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The grace of saints. Paul began this letter by wishing his readers grace in Jesus Christ. That's how he began the letter. And now here in, in, in his conclusion, in his benediction, he mentions the same thing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Introduction, conclusion. And everything in between is related to that same thing. The grace of Jesus Christ. This is how Paul concluded all of his letters. Because he knew that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is critical to the faithfulness of each and every saint. You think you're going to be faithful tomorrow? You know why that might be possible? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You think you're going to be faithful 10 years from now? Well, it's only going to be because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need the grace of Christ. New Testament speaks of grace in a few different ways. One, of course, is in salvation. Uh, you were saved by grace through faith, right? That's, we all know that from Ephesians 2. This is a big part of what it means to experience the grace of God. Our sins have been forgiven because of his grace. He has saved us because of his grace. But additionally, grace, the, gra the same grace of Jesus Christ, not only saves us, but sanctifies us, helps us grow in Christ, help, helps us be the people he wants us to be, to be saints. We know that grace is unmerited favor, and it's... it's Undeserved from God, contrary to the prevailing attitude of the day that would say otherwise. We are by nature rebels, aren't we? Yes. We, we don't submit to God in our you know, natural state. We don't serve him. We don't love him. We run from him. We disobey him. We ignore him. We offend him. Even though he has given us life and sustenance, we turn and run from him. And then in God, then God has mercy and grace towards us. He not only sustains us physically, but he draws us to himself and grants forgiveness of sin, blesses us in Christ, unites us to Christ throughout eternity. Despite our sinfulness, despite our rebellion against God, in his grace and mercy, he loves us and includes us in all the blessings in Christ Jesus. If you were in Christ, you were a saint. 
If you are in Christ, you are saved by grace, you are sanctified by grace all the way through to the end of eternity, which never ends, by the way. Friends, gospel partners, listen. We are now to be governed by grace, guided by grace, sustained by grace, strengthened by grace, sanctified by grace. The grace in Jesus Christ is critical. You may not realize this, but every moment of the day you are dependent upon God's grace. And it all comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved you and gave himself for you. And if he has done all these things for us, our response as saints must be that he is our daily focus. His directives are our directives. His life is ours. Jesus and his grace is central to the letter of Philippians. Jesus and his grace is central to the life of every joyful gospel partner. And he ends the letter the same way he started it, bracketing, bookending the grace of Jesus Christ for all the saints. That is the point of our spiritual lives, that we are dependent and connected to Jesus. Everything about our Christianity reflects Jesus, so everything in our lives should point to him. Let's be joyful, gospel-centered, grace-driven, mission-minded saints at Sun Valley Church. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the grace we've received from you. Unmerited favor, blessing, simply because of your love for us. Father, I, grant, I, I pray that you would grant us as Christians here at Sun Valley Church, as saints here in this time during this um, period of human history, that we would be focused on what it means to be a saint, that we would be dependent on the grace of God, that we would see the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ working in and through us, out to those around us who desperately need the gospel. Help us not to lose sight of these things. Help us not to get distracted by these things or derailed from our gospel partnership. Help us to be a joyful group of saints who look forward to being used of God, who look forward to sacrificing for the benefit of others, who look forward to their neighbors, friends, and loved ones coming to personal faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for all of these things. And it's in the name of our Savior we pray. Amen.